morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Eddie, and I'll be the ballroom host for uh, Ballroom C for the duration of the conference. And uh, today, we have the pleasure of uh, hearing from Amy Grice and Jonathan White. They are pioneers of uh, lighting and electricity at Peninsula Light, Peninsula Light out of Dave Harvard. Uh, Amy is the systems engineer tasked with overseeing, protecting, and developing the data infrastructure down there. And Jonathan is the director for marketing and member services. And he is an advocate for uh, technology and smart meters and uh, smart grids throughout the future sound. So please join me in welcoming them to the stage. Thank you, Eddie. Um, I always like to get an idea of who my audience is. How many of you have worked in the electrical utility industry? Nobody. Else. So everything we tell you today, we can just make it up and you don't even know the difference. <laughs> well, I got a call a couple months ago from these folks uh, putting on the conference. Um, I don't know how they got our iPhone number, but you know, after a couple of interviews, they thought it would be great to have our utility come up and talk about what we're doing with data. Um, and how we're using it to um, improve system reliability. And one of the requirements uh, that I would agree to come speak at the conference, um, but they had to make sure that we brought, I could bring Amy along because I'm an old guy, I've got a few years left in the utility industry, and this is what the face of the utility industry is going to look for the next 20, 30 years. <coughs> we hired Amy a couple years ago, she brought some great value to our, our utility. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the technology that we deployed and some of the technologies that we're in the process of doing. A little bit of background on who uh, Penis Light Company is. We're a uh, electric cooperative. We're a member-owned cooperative. Uh, we're in Gig Harbor. Uh, I imagine Washington. I imagine most of you from the state of Washington here. So most of you know where Gig Harbor is at. Um, this is a Yugoslav uh, community. A lot of the folks are from Cro Croatia. Uh, boat building and fishing has pretty much been their, uh, you know, their, uh, their life work. Uh, it's also an agricultural community with a lot of uh, Scandinavian folks. And in 1925, when there was no power out in the peninsula there, they worked to put together an electric cooperative. Now, a cooperative form of uh, business was something that they were used to because they had farming cooperatives. Um, they liked the idea of having it member-owned and not for profit. Since then, we've grown um, into the uh, second largest co-op in the state of Washington. Uh, I just found out recently we are the sixth oldest co-op in the United States. There's about 950 co-ops uh, throughout the United States. Uh, our load growth is pretty minimal. Uh, we're only growing at about 1% annually. Uh, a lot of this is due to the fact of growth management and the limitations of drinking water in our area. And we have about 30,000 meters. So for those of you who might not be familiar where we're located, we're just about uh, 30 miles southwest of Seattle. We're right across from Tacoma. Here's the Tacoma Peninsula here, and then we have two peninsulas. We have the Gig Harbor Peninsula, and we have the Key Peninsula. We have three islands. The largest is Fox Island right here. We feed this island with a submarine cable. We, in fact, we just got done replacing that cable recently. And then we have a couple more islands. Another one is also fed with a submarine cable. We have about 1,000 miles of electric lines, and to date we've got about 70% of our service ter territory underground. Our community's changed a lot over the years. Um, as you can see, we've now um, have morphed into a retirement community. This is the first time in our history where we have more retirees as head of whole households than uh, folks that are working full time. These are folks that are highly educated. Um, they are moving to the Gig Harbor Peninsula because they want a uh, quality of life in their retirement. But they have some different expectations than we had in the past with our with our. I guess our legacy community, they expect to have power reliability at the same level they had when they lived in maybe in Seattle or Bellevue or Tacoma and urban areas. Um, so the expectations have changed quite a bit. So we're trying to meet that change in expectations by increasing power reliability. We live in a very heavily treed um, community and when you have storms and you have 100 foot trees, it doesn't take too long before power is coming out. 
Power reliability has been our number one um, challenge. Um, we've been working on this since about 1998. We established our first underground reliable, our first underground policy in 1966. But we've really been trying to drive this since we've had a couple major storms. In 1996, we had an ice storm that devastated our system. Uh, it took about two weeks to put it back together. And then in 2006, we had a windstorm. It took about a week to put our system back together. So, you know, the members tend to, when you lose power, they, they, they tend to forget about how, lo how long it takes to put power back together. They expect it to put up right away. It creates a lot of frustration. So this is one of the drivers that we have been using to improve reliability. But we also found out um, that when we do our member surveys, that you know, the members' expectations, um, the drives value and satisfactions is reliability. The other thing that, that really irritates consumers is keeping them informed during outages. It's not so much that the power went out, but one is that are the crews on the way? There's three things they want to know. Do you know my power's out? Are the crews on the way? And when's my power going to be restored? So we're trying to meet those three uh, expectations by posting information using our social media and our web page. Um, and that's just an ongoing challenge that we have to, to deal with with our, with our consumers. But we're doing a great job. We seem to be responding to the outage information that we post um, whenever we have any outages greater than uh, 50. The other challenge is, is data. Um, I'm going to show you a slide here in a few minutes that shows a lot of different technology platforms that we use at the utility. But we're always constantly having to scrub the data to make sure it's accurate. The main platform that we use um, is our customer information system, we commonly refer to as our CIS. We have to go through that system to make sure all the consumer data is updated. This is done every day. We take about 6,000 phone calls a month. Each uh, call is an opportunity to make sure that the data that we're um, having the system is updated constantly. And one of the other major challenges that we have <clears throat> is that we only have a single point of interconnection to the outside world. Since 1925, we've only been served by a single transmission line from Tacoma. When we have a catastrophic event uh, with that transmission line, we lose our whole system. The other challenge for us, um, especially in the co-op world, and this is something Electric Co-op started, oh, about in 2000, um, was multi-speed. With co-ops, electric co-ops, and other utilities deploying new technology, we had a problem of sharing data between these different technology platforms. So we created a common um, data uh, platform called MultiSpeak, and I'll show you a little bit about that here in a second. I mentioned that we do a member survey. We do one every two years. It's done by the National Electric Co-op Association Market Research. This is a valid weighted survey. One of the questions we ask, of course, is about power reliability. And so we know it's a key driver for member satisfaction and value. So if you look at this chart here, you can see that the uh, increase in longer outages or momentary, momentary out outages, like leaks, uh, reduces the consumer's satisfaction rating. So our goal is try to keep these to a minimum. <coughs> I pointed out just a few slides ago, this is our single point of interconnection to the outside, uh, outside world. This is looking from Tacoma west to Gig Harbor. This transmission line used to be the longest span in the, in the world, it no longer is, but it spans about a mile and a quarter across the, the Narrows and it delivers power to our peninsula. When we lose this transmission system, we lose our whole system. So what we've been working on here the last couple of years is a second point of interconnection. Um, we're just about to have that project completed. That second point of interconnection is going to be over in Mason County um, near the Hood Canal. But we'll only use that second point of interconnection if we have a catastrophic event with this transmission line. So as I mentioned, reliability is really important to us. We measure it. We use data to measure it. In our industry, we have a couple uh, indices. Uh, one's called SAFI, and the other one's called SAFI. Now, SAFI is the frequency of outages that occur, and SAFI is the duration of the outage that occurred. 
we measure these indices by substation and feeder, so we can take a look and, and see what are our worst performing circuits. And also, the, these indices or these standards are a nationwide standard, and it allows us to, to see where we're performing in a quartile. As you can see from this slide, in 2005, we we're in the fourth quartile of uh, reliability performance. Um, and we just finished looking at the numbers for 2013, and we finally moved into the first quartile, <coughs> at the bottom of the first uh, quartile, which is great because when you have a rural utility like ours, where the heavily forested um, utility corridor, trying to reach the first um, quartile is a monumental task. But we're up to it, and I think our CEO thought we would be able to do it. Spending six and a half million dollars a year, very 20 miles a year um, is getting us to that point. But just burning powers, uh, putting it underground is not the total solution. This is um, a very simplistic overview of the technology platforms that we have at Peninsula Light Company. <coughs> the ones that are in green are the technologies that I'm responsible for. The one in the top left-hand corners is the customer information system I mentioned to you previously. This contains all the information about the consumers, um, their meter from the meter to the transformer uh, and to the substation, uh, their location, their phone number, um, when we go out and do meter audits, we keep all the auditing data in this uh, database system. It feeds all the other platforms that you're seeing up here on the screen. <clears throat> the interactive voice response system we use for our automated outages. Um, the way that works, in 2006 when we installed this new technology, um, you no longer had to talk to somebody to um, give them the information where the power was out. It would look at your phone number from the customer information system and be able to match your location, your meter and your location of the outage, and then that is texted out or emailed out to all the supervisors on call as well. Now, if we've got the wrong information, the wrong data in the CIS system, we certainly could be dispatching the crews to a wrong location. So it's so important that we scrub this data every day and make sure we have all the, uh, as many, I shouldn't say all the phone numbers, but we try to store three phone numbers per account and include cell phones. So when someone calls in on a cell phone, we know the location of the outage. We can dispatch them to there um, immediately. And we try to reduce that duration of the outage by trying to respond and use this technology. The outage management system, uh, Amy's gonna talk a little bit about, but this is a prediction model. Um, it's getting information or data fed from all these different uh, sources and um, mainly the, the mapping system, GIS mapping system, which is a representation of a connectivity model of our distribution system. Based on the calls that are coming in, um, reclosures or equipment that are open in the field through our SCADA system, the outage management system can predict what caused the outage and we can dispatch the, the crews to that location rather than them driving up and down the street trying to find a needle in a haystack. But in order for this prediction model to work properly, you have to have an accurate GIS mapping system. If that data is incorrect, your prediction model will be wrong. And we found this out. As I mentioned uh, earlier about multi-speed, um, this is a great uh, endeavor by electric co-ops and uh, technology vendors. Uh, it doesn't cost anything to be a multi-speed member. Um, it's uh, getting um, companies, um, software companies together with utilities to make sure that data can um, be moved uh, back and forth between different technology platforms. <coughs> this has been a major breakthrough. It's been hard to bring some of the vendors through, but it, it's now becoming so popular that it actually puts value on another vendor's product that they can say, well, our, our software um, and our data from the software can work with this other um, software technology that you're using. So you don't have to expense a lot of time with your IT staff trying to figure out how you're gonna pull data from one platform and move it over to the other one. So this has been a very successful program and it continues to grow and we're a member of Multi Speed. Real quickly, you know, since this is a conference about data, um, every day we're having to deal with data in our utility business. 
we decided to deploy as a um, prepaid um, payment option last year. It took about, um, well, about nine months to write the interface between our legacy uh, CIS system and the prepaid system. Um, and then we tested it internally. But now we have about 250 consumers who have signed up for prepay. We essentially have turned off the collection process. You no longer get a paper bill. You no longer have a due date. There's no late fees. There's no reconnect fees. And there's no deposits. This is a totally self-managed um, payment option. There's a web portal that you can go to and you can see your usage in dollars or kilowatts by day. So you can see what your burn rate is. Um, you can see if you need to put in $5 a day or $10. You can make as many payments as you want. It's also allowing us to mitigate our exposure to bad debt for consumers that are uh, credit challenged. Um, this deployment required a lot of integration. Um, we had to integrate it with our um, AMR system, our automated meter reading system. Um, so that when you go negative on your account, it will send the signal down through the power lines to your meter and shut the meter off. If your power is out, and once your power goes off, and you make a payment through any one of our payment channels, um, online, call payment in, use our IVR system, every 15 minutes we import those payments back into the billing system, sends a signal back out to the meter, and uh, turns the power back on. It's pretty amazing. But it took a lot of teamwork, a lot of time to write this interface and, and test it and make sure it was, it was working properly. This is a web-based services between our legacy CIS and the prepaid CIS system. Just curious, what's the adoption rate that you have? Yeah, I checked uh, nationwide, 1% annual growth rate with prepaid. There are some utilities that are growing at 2% annually. Um, I'm very happy with 1%. It's a great uh, slow growth in case you had some technology issues you need to deal with. Um, I never like to roll anything out um, too quickly because you're going to typically find when you roll out new technologies, you're going to have some issues that you have to deal with. And, and we did. You know, so we, we wanted to take kind of slow, a, a soft rollout. So after a year, we're at 250, so um, we have about 28,000 28, residential meters. So, you know, basically we met we our 1% growth rate that we were predicting we would. Uh, some other challenges or some current technology projects that we're also working on. Um, I mentioned earlier about our GIS um, system. It's a representation of our, um, of our distribution system. Um, if the data in the mapping system is incorrect, the modeling, the prediction modeling and the outage management system is not going to work properly. Um, for some reason, another, the picture that was supposed to be here uh, was a gentleman with a GPS handheld unit that um, we've hired a company that's going through our system um, we have eight substations, one substation at a time, and then feeder by feeder, um, locating every pole, wire, cross arm, fuse, transformer, meter, anything, any asset that's in the field, and how it's connected will be um, GPS located and then updated um, into our mapping system. So we have a correct mapping model. It's so important to make sure that data is correct. Um, these are, the next three items are part of a, uh, Department of Energy grant that we're doing with uh, 13 other entities here in the Northwest, including the University of Washington. It's called the Northwest Smart Grid Demonstration Project. We got a million dollar grant. Um, we put it, we have to it with our, another million of our own money. But these are the three items that we're working on. Fault detection, isolation, and restoration. Just a fancy name for self-healing. This is a technology that uh, we can deploy in the field with some switching and sensors. Um, this is pretty much where Amy um, is handling on the deployment. This te technology looks at uh, when a fault or an outage is, um, is about to occur or has occurred. Within a second, um, it can isolate the um, section of the line that's um, being affected by the outage and backfeed it, um, restore the power and backfeed it from another direction. 
So um, this is pretty exciting technology. Um, of course, we're not going to just let the uh, SCADA system operate this automatically initially. We're going to uh, do it manually, but we'll certainly look at the scripting that it, it, it provides. Within about one or two seconds, it writes a script of the series of switching that has to take place to isolate and restore power. Um, demand response is becoming a really um, popular initiative here in the Northwest. It's already been happening in the Midwest and East Coast for about the last 10 years. This is where you can put devices on water heaters or air conditioners and control um, your loads um, during peak times. Uh, we've got this fully integrated with our um, automated metering system, uh, some of you call smart meters, and then voltage uh, reduction. Um, we tend to sometimes put um, too much voltage out of the system. The substation, we might start at 126 volts, um, and we want to measure the voltage at the end of line. He was going to talk about some technology, cellular technology we're using to measure voltage um, at the end of line and see if we can reduce that voltage if, there's, if it's not necessary. And then last, I wanted to just kind of throw this at you, um, consumer engagement. You know, we're trying to move uh, the consumers to manage more and more of their account rather than calling in um, and talking to my staff about what their energy usage. A lot of this data that you see on the screen here is in our command center from our smart meters. We're taking that data, we're pushing it out to a web portal. Consumers uh, log in with a username and password. It shows their energy usage. Um, on a daily basis, um, they can send energy markers. For example, if you put in new appliances in your house, you can mark the date you put those appliances in, and it will track what your energy savings has been from that day forward. It also has the outdoor temperature, high, low, and average. You can set challenges um, against the average energy user, or you can set challenges within your own home. The kids like the kids love you know setting up these type of challenges. So this is uh, very exciting for us to finally take this data and move it out to a web portal. Um, one of the things that we're going to talk at the very end is what some of the takeaways. You buy new technology from, from the vendors. And it's really interesting, if I was going to sell you a smart meter technology, um, I would think that I would provide you with an ancillary product so you could push the data out to your consumers. And what we're finding with a lot of vendors as they don't provide us with these ancillary, ancillary byproducts. So we have to go buy them from a third party, unfortunately. So uh, we work with a third party company to set up this web portal and put, push this information out to our consumers. Um, with that, we're gonna move into um, the reliability section that uh, Amy's gonna talk about. Um, as I mentioned before, this is our number one initiative, um, how we're using data to drive reliability. It's not just about putting these down power lines you see here on the screen underground, but it's uh, also looking at um, putting uh, nodes out on the system so we have data coming back um, daily, hourly, analyzing that data. And Amy's gonna talk about the challenges that she's faced with trying to implement these type of technologies in the field. So here's Amy Price. If you have questions at all, please interrupt me and I'll be glad to answer what I can. And if I can't, I'll, I'll get back to you later. Um, the, the two main drivers for our reliability have been underground replacement, as Jonathan's highlighted, and our smart grid advancements. Um, for the underground cable replacements and overhead and to underground conversions, we started off um, back in 1998. And at that time, basically, the thought was just get the lines underground. And so there wasn't a lot of um, thought put into necessarily where the most proactive places to go would be. They just started putting 20 miles underground. And so what happened was for the first 10 years of that project, um, it was basically just what was easiest, what could be very quickly dug up and thrown underneath the ground. And so that was what we saw. Um, in 2007, we kind of had a sea change of the utility. The CEO came on board, new engineering manager, and they started looking a little bit more at, at why that reliability hadn't really improved even though they've spent all this money putting lines under the ground. And so they started looking at the data a little bit better, um, started to actually analyze what was going on and, and identified our top 10 worst circuits. And so those are what have been highlighted since for 
getting underground, and we've really seen a drastic improvement since they started looking at the data and using it in a way to to actually improve where we needed to go with it. Um, by 2017, we hope to have about 80% of the system underground it, but at that point, we're pretty much at a maximum point because we have a lot of wetlands in the area, we have a lot of highway crossings, um, waterways that we just we can't put anything else underground at that point. So. Um, that's where we're starting to look at now and the smart grid um, money when that came about three years ago really helped drive where our next steps would be to continue improving the reliability without basically getting everything else underground and so that's when I came on board at the utility it was about two years ago uh, right after they've been awarded the funds but the project had already been put in place next three slides are basically a look at what the data looked like originally in 97 and basically the tools that we used then to determine where to underground our circuits as you can tell this is just a manually created excel graph and that's pretty much what they used um, in 2009 we implemented a access database that we developed and it started showing us tabular data still very manual process very much human interaction um, but it gave a little more insight as to what circuits really were our worst and where we wanted to improve. Um, what we're doing right now is we took our AMR data, which is our automated meter reading system. And for us, our smart meters are uh, power line carrier technology. We get one bit per 20 minutes back. So to say we have smart meters means that we bill automatically but to use them for anything else is not really feasible we can't automate what's coming back it can take up to three days for this data to be validated by the system before we can even present it on that pretty graph that jonathan has from my meter so we needed a better tool we needed this power line carrier technology has a lot of other analytics within it but it hides it's all in tabular format down underneath the database there's no great visualization tools that are built into the system it's really up to us to look at that data and have time to figure out what it means and so we partnered with a consultant about a year ago who had actually developed the um, technology with the vendor 15 years ago and used his knowledge of the data that the system has natively to visualize it and feed it up to us so this is still relatively a, um, a beta format per se, but it's been our first look into the automatic data that's coming back that we haven't had available before. Um, what this graph shows along the top, um, the little spikes are our transmission outages. Um, on May 12th, that was a windstorm that blew through. The, um, I believe it's August 5th, or September 5th, was a massive transmission outage where our entire service area was out for about five hours, three hours from a logging truck that took out those lines that Jonathan showed at the first part. Um, and then November 2nd was the windstorm that blew through just past November. Before this, this was all just, you know, our, our memory pulling up these dates and going, oh yeah, this is what happened on that day. Now we've got a visual tool that actually shows it. These bottom couple graphs down here show our actual circuits. And as you can see on the second one, our Dale Drive, we should probably look at undergrounding or going out and doing something proactively to that area. The other graph where it's got the white out here on the left, that's actually in individual addresses. And what that's showing us is per meter, um, how many outages that meter saw. This data only comes back in every so often. It's not something that's a real-time database type of infrastructure at all. But based off of this, I can tell that there's something going on at that house that we need to go look at. And this is on our side. This isn't something that's going on on the customer side. This is something that we need to go out and proactively look at. But until this dashboard is available, we have no idea. Until somebody calls and says, hey, my lights keep blinking. What's going on? Can you come look at it? This tool is gonna to be able to allow us to proactively get out there and show people and, and fix things before they even have to call us. Um, when I started in the industry 12 years ago, I was putting in RTUs at the substations. We had a beautiful fiber network. I never had to worry about communications. It all came back. We pulled it two seconds. Beautiful system. Out of pen light, we're all licensed radio. Some of the sites come in, some of them go out. Uh, zero value could be a valid value, or it could be that our communications are not working. 
the, the back end software, the actual database with all the values sitting there has no idea. And so we really had to rely on people looking at it and going, oh yeah, well that day the calm was out. That we had a massive windstorm that, you know, half of our substations didn't have any communications to it, so that's why all the data is zero. Um, we're putting in some more intelligent devices now with 4G modems that allow me to actually see when this communication's out, we can play the data and therefore get more accurate information. This was the traditional SCADA view, very tabular. Somebody has to be looking at it, it's not automated. What we're looking at now is a map-based, um, this is a direct import from our ESRI database. It will be live, well it is live now, it's a real-time power flow, um, power system analysis tool. This drives our outage management system. Um, this will eventually drive the um, automatic restoration and isolation of faults and our volt bar control um, system. What you're looking at on that screen there is our entire electrical system. That is every single line um, down to transformers that we have on our system. The major black areas or kind of holes out there are just dead land. It's either for service or a prison or something else that doesn't have an actual line running through. This Fox Island area right here is um, almost exclusively electric power. Um, there's no gas infrastructure out to the island at all. And so this is basically where we're trying out the smart grid technology and the money that was given to us. Um, I've replaced a lot of the old equipment that was out there with newer equipment with better communications and more accurate voltage and current readings. So that this system, with the back end analysis tool, can run and be accurate and and redirect power in the most efficient manner. Um, a lot of the equipment that we're putting out right now has been in place for 30 to 50 years. It's um, high maintenance. We go out once a year and look at every single device, and I believe every three years we physically pull it down and um, test it, re-oil it. And and then hang it back up. The new technology that we're putting out uh, is almost exclusively built by Schweitzer Engineering Laboratories over in Pullman, the industry leader for us. Um, but what they're doing is putting in new advanced algorithms into their system that we've never had available for. It actually will sit up on the line and learn what the, the signatures and the, the current should look like to predictively tell us when there's problems. We've been putting out um, tree wire, which is a new type of wire as well. So for runs where we can't underground, but we have a lot of tree coverage, it's got a coating on it. It's not an insulator, it's just a strength, basically. It's, it just gives it some extra strength and allows lines to actually lay on top of it. The problem with it is if it does break and lays on the ground, it looks like just a high load. But as it lays on the ground, it has a different um, electrical signature to it that the newer technology will hopefully tell us about and allow us to take the, the lines down um, remotely without having to send somebody out there to find the down power lines and have all the um, safety considerations that might be there. And then my, my newest uh, technology initiative has been fault indicators and cellular modems and transformer monitors. Um, I deployed the first fault indicators from one of our vendors when they were 2G, AT&T only. Um, Verizon eventually came out with them and allowed them to um, use their system to communicate back. Those um, devices right here cannot be replaced. It's really a throwaway device, but they were so cheap compared to anything else that I could find to do this remote um, capability that we were okay with the seven year life. Now, most technology you think about, you don't say, oh, seven years, well, that's that's a pretty good lifespan. Um, traditionally, for utility, we're looking at 30 to 40 year lifespans. When you do business plans for this, this massive um, capital investment, you're not looking at seven to two, 10 years life. So that's been a big challenge um, for most of the utility industry in general to come to terms with, that as you want to deploy new technology, you have to be okay with that shorter lifespan than what you've traditionally been used to. Um, one of the problems I'm having right now is that I 
based off of the 2G experience and knowing the 2G on AT&T is going away in the relatively near future, I don't want to see our utility invest in 3G and have it go away relatively soon as well. I still want to, even though we know that we probably won't get more than about seven to 10 years out of these equipment. I want to position it so that we hopefully get as much as we possibly can. And so um, I've been talking with a lot of our vendors, um, a lot of, as I go out to the various conferences and try to find the new technology, I want 4G modems. And that has been an incredibly difficult find for us. Um, I had no idea when I started on that uh, kind of trajectory that it was going to be difficult to find what I needed, the accuracy levels, to have a 4G <coughs> modem in. I never would have thought that that would have been difficult, but it's, it's been hard. And so um, what I have been using, I have to basically go shopping for it again. And every time I do that, because the, the infrastructure that we have built out on the back end is so, well, it's 1995 technology. So it's very picky about the way that it communicates. We have to test every single device until I know for sure that it's gonna work for us. So out of our 80 person company, we have me and one contact that deploys all of this. And so the, the testing takes a lot of our time. Um, so once we do land on something, that's basically where we're gonna be for a number of years. The transformer monitors down here in the corner of the little blue box <coughs> and the cellular modem that I decided to go with are both a 4G unit, but they're both the same underneath. So that means when we start configuring the cellular at the side of it, it's gonna be the same regardless of if I'm bringing back or reclose or information or transformer monitoring information. The transformer monitors, what Jonathan didn't really highlight much was with our meter, metering technology and the fact that we purchased it for billing um, but we can't do a lot of the extra that we would like to do with the automatic outage detection. Um, we can't feed other than the uh, setup that Jonathan has with the, um, on the back side, the billing information. We can't open that up for you to just connect to your meter um, at your house. It's just not feasible. And once, if the Zigbee or anything like that for home automation comes out, we'll have to actually go replace each and every meter. And for us, we can't do that. So I'm hoping with these transformer monitors, they're a modular device where we'll be able to plug in some extra cards as they're developed that might, might be able to open up that realm that we wouldn't otherwise be able to offer for many, many years. Are there any questions so far? Um, so as I highlighted, the, the transition between the traditional and the new, it's, it's a hard um, process to get everybody to come to terms with. We have to change both our board's perspective and our CEOs and our operational crews as well. Um, but at the end of the day, what we're doing is providing better data. And what we do with the better data, um, what this slide shows is, is an analysis of different methods for calculating the safety statistics, the duration of our outage. What this shows is how the human interaction with the data can manipulate the statistics. Um, and what we're trying to do is take that element out by providing it better data so that our systems can calculate these statistics instead of having the human interaction with them. And then on the back side of that is being able to feed out information to our members. Um, right now it is a very manual process. Our, our Facebook page, our Twitter page, our website, all of that is updated manually, and eventually we'll get to where we can have that automated. But all the data that I bring back in from the field and then push back out has to be maintained, and it has to be clean, and it has to be 100%. Any questions? Some lessons learned and takeaways for us. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you know you have all these various different types of technology platforms that interface with your engineering department, your operations, and your, your front end um, um, office, um, and trying to get these to um, move data cleanly between these different platforms. Um, so that's always going to be a challenge. It's getting easier with the multi-speed platform. Um, the other thing too is uh, I mentioned about our. 
AMR system, our automated meter reading system. We bought it because we wanted an accurate and reliable meter reading system, and it's delivered that. But if we want to leverage anything else out of that, it's been difficult, if not impossible. But we are making some headway. Um, it's interesting that vendors that sell you technology um, don't provide you um, with some ancillary byproducts that you could leverage your investment. Unfortunately, you have to go to third-party vendors to sometimes get that. Um, and the other issue is, in today's world for utilities, energy analytics um, is, is a very, very um, popular um, subject. Um, and it's um, being driven by a lot of third-party vendors that are out there trying to provide utilities with the analytic tools that we can take the data from all these different platforms and see how well we're performing um, on a business, um, on, on our bus with our business model. So, with that, any, any questions? So, that's the thing that um, I'm trying to wrap my head around is sort of like that high-level business model, right? Um, first of all, it's, um, it was a learning experience for me to understand all of the information that goes into making sure the lights stay on in my house, which I live on the East Coast. But, um, and the communication that you use to bring the data back in to keep the reliability, right, keep the reliability up, right, the duration of outages down, or your, I guess your FI and your, D, your DI. But as a co-op, talk to me about sort of those high level sort of business metrics. You, you, it, you, a lot of expenditure has gone into driving that reliability up, up which is gonna drive customer satisfaction up. But can you talk to me a little bit about what your financial model is as a co-op? Well, um, yeah, so, so we have two parts to our budget, like everybody else. We have a capital budget and we have an operating budget. We're a $50 million business. Um, 25 million of that money goes right to the Bonneville Power Administration. That's who we buy our power from. Um, so that leaves us with $25 million um, to operate um, our business on and to improve system reliability. So what we try to do, we have like a 20 year business plan and we're looking at how much money do we have to continue to put into the system. We have a banker, it's called the Co-op Finance Corporation and uh, we have to look at our investment in our distribution system just like you look at your investment in your house. You have a new roof, you have a new foundation, you have an electrical system. If you're not maintaining your asset on your house, um, you're going to get um, some concerns from uh, next time you try to get a mortgage loan and they'll say, hey, you need to do these upgrades or your insurance company knocks on the door and says, hey, uh, you need a new roof on your house. And the same thing in the electrical industry, our, our financial uh, banker, the Co-op Finance Corporation, um, has a, a uh, mechanism for measuring uh, what they expect our financial investment is into our distribution system, keeping it modernized. If we didn't modernize our system and invest in new equipment, new technology, and we let it go for 15 years, and then we got ourselves in a situation and came back to their to our banker and said, uh, we need to borrow about $100 million to put this thing back. So, that's what we're always working with, with our insurance company, our banker, our finance corporation, to make sure that we are investing into our system and we're meeting those, um, I guess, third criteria. But it sounds like you're doing more than investing. You're trying to bring like a different sort of model to the Yeah, that's a good question. You know, there are, there are a lot of different types of utilities. There are investor-owned utilities um, that have stockholders that expect the return on their investments. And there is public utilities in Washington State. 80% um, of the utilities in the state of Washington are public utilities. We have a strong history, a legacy of uh, providing public power to um, the residents of Washington State. And a cooperative um, is one form of public power. There's a public utility district, there's municipal uh, uh, utilities like uh, South City Light, um, uh, Snohomish County UV is an example of public utility. We're a not-for-profit, and what, what drives us is, is making sure that we're delivering great value for the rates and the service that we deliver to our consumers. 
that is our that drives our business model is making sure that our consumers are happy with the value that they're paying for their rates and they're getting the most value out of that it, it seems kind of unusual in, in, in today's world that utilities think that way but that's what's great about public power and it's great that we're in the state of washington that we have this long history of public power serving the, the community how new is analytics to the utilities industry? Um, what does that meant to your budget for finding room for it? And have you had any pushback against that if it has meant a lot to them, increasing the budget? That yeah, that's a good question. Um, there's always pushback. Um, you have uh, various departments. Um, you know, you have your um, IT folks who are always pushing this back. Um, and what we're trying to determine what our needs are so we can do our job. Uh, the best that we can. Now, where we're realizing the savings is that we're not paying overtime like we used to. They have their crews go out and maintain the system. In 2000, uh, 1996, it took two weeks to get our system back out. Um, and in 2006, when we had the windstorm, it took us one week. And in January of 2012, we had a snow, uh, snow and ice uh, storm. And we got our system back up in 72 hours. And the first time in our history, we sent our crews to Tacoma Power to help them out. So where we're realizing the savings is on the back end. And uh, our growth, as you saw, was only 1%. We used to be double digit. Um, those days are gone. And they're never coming back because we have a limitation of, of water resources and growth management is also preventing you know, uncontrolled growth in our area. So what's keeping our employees um, occupied is um, undergrounding and deploying new technologies. We have to have smarter uh, uh, linemen these days. We have a whole uh, shop of uh, gentlemen uh, called the Wire Shop. They're Amy's up as uh, designing the stuff in the in the, in the back, uh, front office and, and the back end and the field. These guys are installing the technology, and she's working directly with these guys to make sure the communications with the cellular uh, radio is working properly. So. Um, to answer your question, that we're realizing savings through reliability, and we're taking that savings and reinvesting it back into the system. Could you speak a little to, you know, so it sounds like one one way that you can increase some of your resources is through grant applications. Uh, so, you know, you apply for a grant, you get a million dollars. Could you speak a little to what the internal conversation is like then around, you know, do we buy versus build? Do we increase permanent staffing versus, you know, finding a consultant and, and how some of that has worked out? Well, you know, the Smart Grid Demonstration Grant Project's been great, it's been a good learning experience, but to tell you the truth, it's really pain in the butt. Um, the government requires a lot of regulations. Um, it's supposed to be dollar for dollar, it's not dollar for dollar. We're probably spending two or three dollars to what the government's putting in. Um, they have a lot of requirements on how cycle, of course, cyber security is important for us, um, but there's just a lot of regulations that have to be met uh, today, when, for example, I came up here to talk to uh, this conference, I had to call um, the folks at Patel Institute and make sure that um, I was not going to infringe on the uh, requirements for um, talking about the demonstration uh, pro uh, project in the public because they have certain requirements. Um, it, I wouldn't say it's been a hindrance to be involved in, in grant projects, but I don't think we'll do it again. Okay. So so overall, you'll stick to reallocating internally. Or exactly. And I think that we find that sometimes we're so far ahead of the curve from the other utilities that we're sitting there waiting for them to catch up. So um, electric co-ops in the nation, um, about 40% deployed with smart meter technology. Um, the rest of the utilities are probably lagging behind at 10 or 15%. So they're having to use other type of technologies to communicate back to the meter. Uh, with demand response, even though we have a, a, very, a very narrow bandwidth um, smart meter, we can still send a signal out to a load controller and shut it off within 15 minutes. We can't get data back, but we, we can certainly communicate back and forth to the meter or any devices that are out there. It's the data that's kind of the, the roadblock. Have you have searched how many customers have used their data visualization of their own personal use and what's the impact of that on us? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, just ran the numbers on that the other day. We have about uh, 900 folks uh, that have started using the MyMeter product that we launched last September. 
Um, we certainly need to increase that, so we're working with the vendor in some ways that um, we can get the consumer and under a web page be able to just jump right into it. But the concern that I had when I put, put this out on the web portal, I wanted a single user sign in. I didn't want our consumers to have another username and another password to get them to use their, um, look at their uh, usage information. So we're, we just had a discussion about that, how we could maybe keep the single user sign in, but find a, a, a quicker or easier way for them to um, get into that portal. Um, the other part of your question is really good. It's what we call behavioral-based energy efficiency. How are we changing the behavior of the consumer when they have, when you engage them to look at their energy usage? And uh, uh, Bonneville is, uh, Power is working with us, uh, our utility as well as other utilities in the Northwest to see how we can change the behavior of consumers by getting them um, into um, managing their energy usage just through these web portals. I guess my time is up.